Okay, so we're about to see uh, Jean-Baptiste Michel, who is a, uh, uh, from uh, Harvard and Google, who is going to be talking some about his Google Book Project and other things. We were in 2014, we don't really think 
just no one can care. And I think these tools will change uh, the way research needs to be done currently. I think that these tools are an added, an extremely powerful added value to however we're doing things right now. It's, it's something that is supplements, that complements to what we have currently. Now, we would like to say that yeah, one very interesting thing about the data, to the right of the data, is that it's kind of like people describe it as uh, you know having a powerful energy for a nail. Because when you start, when you when you it's sometimes hard to understand what questions are being answered by this data. So, so the way we built the Google Books um, in Europe, we had in mind the idea of measuring things about the evolutionary dynamics of language and philosophy. We don't know about the mathematical evolution of culture. We really looked at, we were thinking from a biological and mathematical standpoint, we were thinking about the evolution of organisms, or how about the evolution of culture, what are the laws, what are the mathematics of that? We need the data. So let's turn Google Books into a tool that can help us understand the data behind cultural evolution. And so we wanted to look at that, birth rates, death rates. When we looked at the data for the first, first time, we realized that the questions we had we need were not going to be answered by this data. But we realized that there were far more questions that we would never have anticipated that this data was actually answering. So it's, it's hard to, to, uh, to use these tools. One of the reasons this type of tools to human, to researchers in the humanities, they ask us, oh, but, uh, why can't I answer question X? Yes. This tool must not be useful. This tool is bad. Because it's really because question X is not tailored to that tool. So, and more particularly, these tools are very suitable for data driven explorations. You essentially use these tools to show you things that you could not have assimilated. Then you have to ask yourself, why are things the way they are? What makes it that way? So this is the shift in, uh, in the way we approach questions in, in uh, social and personality psychology. Side number 12. One of the most challenging aspects of this, which is also a given opportunity, is that most of the data uh, are owned by a handful of private corporations. There is a unprecedented gap between the amount of data available to private corporations, data about the human experience, and the data available to academics. If you want to know about social structure, would you go to sociology professors in a leading university, or would you go to Facebook and ask for unfettered access to their network? Of course, what you want is a leading, leading a social scientist having unfettered access to the Facebook. So that's very interesting for researchers because it actually this is interesting because it means that our work is already tailored. We don't have to create the data, the data is already created, it already exists. It's just a matter of going to get it. And when we get it, it's a pretty big data set. So you can our years and years and years of research to just one data set. So of course how do you do that? So in our case, uh, we have to talk to the right person. We talk to many people at Google. And if you want to talk to the very top people, nothing happens. So in our case, we ended up speaking with Peter Norvig, the director of research at Google. And he thought we were going to make it crazy. And we did it two years ago. So I think the right person is very important. Uh, second thing is we need to make sure that whatever you're going to do with our data is not going to harm the company's interests. So that's ethically difficult. But why would the company help you access their data if you're going to damage something for them? Whether it's intellectual property or, or trade secrets or just adding. So that's, that's a tough problem. Um, and then, of course, you need to make sure that whatever you're going to do is going to ask them limited resources out. You don't want to ask them to put the company all kinds of things for you. You want to make sure that you, you can make a case for a very simple thing. That will open a lot of uh, doors to you, but that requires extremely little energy for Google or Facebook or whatever other company to put in place. And, and uh, so there are lots of questions around how academics deal with big corporations. And many things can be said about that. Time is a bit short. 
But the point is, this, this is a new territory for scientists, and we need to learn as academics and institutions. We need to back us up on that. We need to think hard about to make this happen. We need to make it possible for us academics to go into corporations and uh, use their the massive amount of data that they have created to answer fundamental questions about the human experience. It's going to be fun. Uh, slide number 13. So, uh, for us, we've seen, we started to understand that uh, this field is a legal and ethical minefield. Nothing is not true. That's an opportunity. That means that we have the we will shape the legal and the ethical landscape of big data research and social sciences and psychology. In the context of biomedical um, uh, research, for instance, there are ethical and ethics board that exist that help us understand how we should make experiments. In most cases, you need to ask the consent of your subjects. If you want to run an experiment on a massive social network, are you going to ask the consent of a million people? That's most likely infeasible. So we do think things differently here. Ethically, how do we, how do we at least uh, balance the, the greater good, the search for knowledge, with the interests of companies that own the data that we need? Sciences cannot be understated. We need to fight for that. 
uh, of September 16, I have to make uh, clear that uh, we just took a look at the Uncharted with my friend Erez. And uh, we explain in great details uh, everything that I've just told you, in particular these last few points, like the opportunities and the challenges and how to overcome them, and what are things that have worked for us and maybe that could work for you. Uh, it's a great book. Now, slide number 17. I just want to leave you with uh, one thought. There's this tension between theory and, and data, and whether you do data-driven research or theory-driven research. Uh, of course, uh, physics in the 20th century has been the prime example of the massive successes driven by theory alone, not data. Uh, but I think there are other examples. Like, this doesn't have to be that way. And the way I think of uh, big data, of social science and psychology research in, the, in these days of big data is, I think, very similar to the early days of thermodynamics. So we, in the early days of thermodynamics, when really in the early days of the Industrial Revolution, there was no theory. There was no good theory for how machines, steam machines worked. People were experimenting left and right. And that was creating tremendous amounts of innovation. And, uh, but they didn't know really how uh, heat would be converted in work and work converted in heat. And so they, they kind of fiddled around in the dark, data-driven. They looked at what worked. They created new ways of new mechanisms and figured out that, well, it worked better this way or that way. Then along came Sadi Carnot, uh, decades down the line of um, thermodynamics. And Sadi Carnot took a step back. And he thought hard about, now that there was data about thermodynamics, thought hard about what the principles, underlying principles should be. He discovered the second law of thermodynamics. And that powered the second expansion of thermodynamics. I think we're in the early days right now in big data of the thermodynamics analogy. We have tools that are far more powerful. We can build tools that are far more powerful than, uh, than what we had before. And, and they're so powerful that the questions we currently have are not adapted to them. So we're going to go data driven. We're going to discover a whole bunch of things that seem really amazing. Some of them are actually are really amazing. And I think that soon, some years, some decades, maybe down the line, as the body of data will have been solid enough, maybe somebody like Stadi Carnot can come along and make us understand what underlies the dynamics and structure of, of human society and our social psychology. So I think these are extremely, extremely exciting times. We can build the microscope or the telescope of social and personality psychology, of social science, and the humanities. And we're going to make amazing discoveries down this road. Thank you very much.